In 1942, the Grumman F-4F Wildcat was the Navy's frontline carrier-borne fighter and key to the United States' survival in the war in the Pacific. F-4F pilots flew against the finest aviators of the Imperial Japanese Navy in such pivotal battles as Coral Sea, Midway, the Eastern Solomons, Guadalcanal, and Santa Cruz. The Wildcat then continued service in the Atlantic and Pacific in the form of the FM-2. The exploits of U.S. Navy and Marine Corps pilots are legendary, and so is their airplane. Just two decades after the Wright brothers flew from Kitty Hawk, the United States Navy began developing methods for taking air power to sea. One of the lessons of the First World War had been that air power would be the warfare of the future. Aircraft would take the war beyond the horizon, and aircraft carriers would meld air power with sea power. The first aircraft carrier for the Navy was the USS Langley, the more modern Saratoga and Lexington soon followed, and new types of airplanes were needed to fill their decks. Planes designed for short takeoffs and landings. The doctrine of the day called for scout bombers to locate the enemy, inflict damage, and then let the battleships finish the job. But the scout bombers would have to be protected against enemy fighters. The first fighter planes for the Navy were the Hawk series, designed by Curtis. Early Curtis designs were built with inline engines, but later designs, such as the BF-2C, utilized a radial engine. This engine type proved easier to maintain on board an aircraft carrier, and all subsequent carrier planes used this type of engine. Boeing soon took over the decks of the Saratoga and Lexington with their F-4B. Boeing's F-4B was compact and rugged and was used by both the Navy and the Army Air Corps in the form of the P-12. But in the mid-1930s, the Grumman Corporation would become a permanent fixture on U.S. Navy carrier decks. Among Grumman's first fighter designs were the F-2F and the F-3F. Both incorporated an all-metal fuselage and retractable landing gear designed to absorb the shock of carrier landings. The F-3F was larger than the Curtis and Boeing designs, but also more powerful. The F-3F-2 was powered by the Wright R-1820 Cyclone engine and had a top speed of 264 miles per hour. As soon as the F-3F joined the fleet, the U.S. Navy Bureau of Aeronautics began looking for its replacement. In March of 1936, the Navy awarded contracts to Grumman and Brewster for a new prototype capable of 300 miles per hour. Designers at Grumman had intended the XF-4F to be another biplane. However, designers at Brewster were making a monoplane. Realizing that Brewster would have the advantage of a more modern design, Grumman resubmitted their design for the XF-4F as a monoplane also. The XF-4F-2's maiden flight was September 2, 1937, and the prototype was delivered to the Anacostia Naval Air Station in December. Competition trials between Grumman and Brewster's XF-2A began on March 1, 1938. During the trials, the Grumman prototype experienced engine problems, which ultimately led to the Brewster fighter winning the competition. In June, the Navy awarded Brewster a contract for 54 of their nimble F-2A fighters. Although Grumman had lost the competition, the Navy still had interest in their fighter. Grumman set about redesigning the F-4F. The new Pratt & Whitney R-1830-76 engine was installed, 
and the tail and wing tips were extended and squared off. The result was a new airplane that exceeded the Navy's original request and outperformed the Brewster Buffalo. The Dash 3 prototype reached a maximum speed of 334 miles per hour and had a surface ceiling of 35,000 feet. By February 1939, the new fighter was ready for the Navy to review and Grumman was awarded a production contract for 54 F4F-3s in August. Delivery of F-4Fs began in late 1940, after war had already begun in Europe. Early Dash-3s were delivered to the Navy, wearing the pre-war neutrality paint scheme consisting of an aluminum painted body and chrome yellow wings for easy recognition. The first Navy fleet squadrons to receive the F-4F were VF-7 off the Wasp and the Rangers VF-4. During that first deployment, it was discovered that the flotation bags installed in the wings that were intended to keep the F-4F afloat after ditching had a tendency to inflate during high-speed dives. The Navy ordered them removed from all further F-4Fs on the production line. In general, pilots were pleased with the Wildcat. It was well-built and had few vices in flight, but there were a few criticisms. All systems were pneumatic. There were no hydraulics on the F-4F. Everything had to be done by hand. For instance, in order to raise the landing gear, the pilot had to turn the landing gear crank 29 times. While the undercarriage of the F-4F may have looked fragile, it was well designed and could take the punishment of carrier landings. Meanwhile, the landing gear of the Brewster F-2A was deemed not sturdy enough for repeated carrier landings, and the order for Grumman's F-4F-3 was increased to 200. Delivery of the new Dash-3A began in May 1941. F-4F-3As were powered by the Pratt & Whitney R-1830-90 and were intended for export to Greece, until that country fell to Axis forces. The Dash-3As looked identical to the Dash-3s, except for a few minor changes to the cowling flaps. VF squadrons, like those on the Wasp, continued to put the Wildcat through the demanding rigors of carrier operations. This was still a new type of aviation, and mistakes were many and costly. In October, the Navy gave the F-4F the official name of Wildcat. And by the end of 1941, eight Navy and three Marine squadrons were equipped with Grumman's sturdy fighter. The United States had not been the only nation to recognize the potential of naval air power. On December 7th, Japan launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in an attempt to wipe out the American Pacific Fleet. The aerial armada of Imperial Japanese Navy bombers and fighters had taken off from six aircraft carriers. Their attack was devastating. However, as fate would have it, the two U.S. carriers in the Pacific, the Lexington and Enterprise, were on maneuvers. Enterprise got the news of the attack while still at sea and launched aircraft to search for the Japanese fleet. Unsuccessful in their search, Six Wildcats from VF-6 were directed to Fort Island and tragedy. We immediately sent out aircraft looking for the Japanese, but uh, couldn't find them. And our pilots were running low on fuel, our Wildcat pilots running low on fuel, so they flew into Pearl Harbor and uh, Fort Island. And a couple of them were immediately shot down. The the uh, gunners around the area thought they were Japanese returning. And it turned out to be that uh, they weren't Japanese, they were our own airplanes. And uh, as we steamed into Pearl on the 9th of December, we, the first thing we saw was one of our aircraft uh, sitting in the mud at uh, Hospital Point. Three pilots were killed and four F-4Fs were lost. The reason the Enterprise had been at sea was to deliver 12 Wildcats for Marine Corps Fighter Squadron 211 to Wake Island. On December 8, 1941, 
36 Japanese Nell twin-engine bombers flew over 700 miles from Kwajalein to drop bombs on Wake. Seven Wildcats were destroyed on the ground. VMF-211 pilots were left with only five to defend the island. Two days after their first attack, the Japanese bombers returned. That day, Captain Henry T. Elrod had been on patrol and shot down two bombers. The following day, he strafed and bombed the destroyer Kisaragi, which blew up. Elrod was later killed on the ground defending a gun emplacement. After the war, he was awarded a posthumous Medal of Honor, one of eight that would go to Wildcat pilots. After the first attempt to take the island failed, the Japanese returned with a larger force, including two of the aircraft carriers used in the attack on Pearl Harbor. The island fell on December 23rd, but the Marines on Wake had fought valiantly and did extract a small measure of revenge from the victors. Wildcat pilot Herb Fruler shot down a Kate carrier bomber piloted by Naburo Kanai. Kanai is credited with dropping the bomb that sank the USS Arizona in Pearl Harbor. In 1942, the U.S. Pacific Fleet bounced back with a series of hit-and-run raids on Japanese bases. The first strikes were carried out by aircraft launched from the Enterprise against Japanese forces on Kwajalein Atoll. Covering the attack were F-4Fs from Wade McCluskey's VF-6. During the engagement, Lieutenant Junior Grade Wilmer Rawley scored the first aerial kill of the war for the Navy and the Wildcat. Later that month, the Lexington took her air group to the South Pacific to strike at Rabao. However, the task force was detected by the Japanese and 17 land-based Betty bombers were sent to deal with it. Radar on board the Lexington discovered the approaching bombers and Lieutenant Commander Jimmy Thatch's Wildcats from VF-3 were launched to greet them. During the interception, Lieutenant Edward Butch O'Hare became the Navy's first ace of World War II. Butch O'Hare was a graduate of the Naval Academy and had been assigned to VF-3 in 1940. He was an experienced carrier pilot and a very good shot. When Lieutenant Commander Ito's squadron began their attack on the Lexington, O'Hare and his wingman were directed to intercept them and dove into the attack. With expert marksmanship, O'Hare dispatched his targets one by one. He shot down three bombers and mortally wounded two others. His final victim, Lieutenant Commander Ito's lead bomber, already trailing smoke, tried desperately to reach its target, but finally fell to the Lexington's anti-aircraft guns. This dramatic aerial battle took place in view of those on board the carrier. For this action, O'Hare was awarded the Medal of Honor. Promoted to Lieutenant Commander, O'Hare returned to combat in 1943. As carrier air group commander on board the Enterprise, he was instrumental in developing combined night fighter tactics. O'Hare was killed during a night interception of a Betty bomber approaching the Enterprise. The circumstances of his death have never been fully determined. Today, the busiest airport in the world bears his name. On February 24th, TBDs from the Enterprise bombed the Japanese on Wake Island. VF-6 provided cover for the bombers. The Enterprise then performed a pre-dawn strike against Marcus Island before returning to Pearl. In March, Lexington and Yorktown teamed up for a combined effort against Japanese shipping at Lei, New Guinea. Wildcats from VF-3 and VF-42 escorted the TBD and SBD bombers, but met no opposition. While Enterprise had been at Pearl, she received the new F-4F-4. The Dash 4 incorporated a major change in the design of the Wildcat. Instead of fixed wings, Wildcats now had folding wings, which allowed for more room above and below decks. Grumman also increased the armament from four 50 caliber machine guns to six. However, the weight of the extra machine gun and the wing folding mechanism meant that the total number of rounds of ammunition per gun had to be decreased. Experienced pilots were not pleased with the new configuration. Even though the new Dash 4s had more machine guns, Wildcat pilots now had less firing time to use them. 
After early carrier trials, pilots complained that the newer Dash 4 Wildcat did not perform as well on the air as the earlier Dash 3. The Dash 4 was still too heavy. To save more weight, Grumman removed the wing folding mechanism. From that point on, Wildcat wings had to be positioned manually by crews on deck. On April 8th, the Enterprise was back at sea. VF-6 was still familiarizing themselves with their new Dash 4s. Routine carrier air patrols, known as CAPs, were still the order of the day. On the 13th, the Enterprise met up with the aircraft carrier Hornet. Off in the distance, we saw another aircraft carrier, and we couldn't figure out what that aircraft carrier was loaded down with. Turned out that it was the Hornet loaded down with B-25s. We speculated, well, we're going to take those airplanes down to one of the islands and leave them. But later that day, we were informed that General Doolittle was going to fly his squadron off of the Hornet and bomb Tokyo. Everybody was elated. That was the dream that we were looking at. We had to get to Tokyo. General Doolittle wanted to get within 400 miles, but they had to take off at 600 miles, and they flew in, did their work, and as soon as the last airplane got off the deck, Buddy turned around and boy, we shagged out of there fast. The damage to Japan by Doolittle's Raiders was superficial, but the morale boost to the United States was immeasurable. Although the first combat sorties gained some aerial victories, operational losses for Wildcats were high. Losses were mainly attributed to poor weather and inexperienced air crew. The flight deck of an aircraft carrier can be a dangerous place, especially when aircraft are landing. The responsibility of ushering the pilot onto the flight deck belongs to the landing signal officer. The LSO communicates to the pilot by a series of gestures. At a precise moment, the LSO either clears the pilot for landing or waves him off to try again. Once cleared to land, the carrier's trapping system goes into effect. Each carrier has a series of wires across the deck and each aircraft is equipped with an arrestor hook designed to catch one of those wires. Beyond the wires is a barrier meant to stop planes that have not caught a wire. Planes that missed the barrier careened into parked planes at the end of the deck. Everyone worked as a team to make sure that planes landed safely. In early May, Yorktown and Lexington were sent to the Coral Sea to hit Tulagi in the Solomons and to intercept a Japanese troop convoy heading for Port Moresby, New Guinea. On May 7th, a 93-plane strike group from both the Lexington and the Yorktown found the advancing Japanese force centered around the light carrier Shoho. Planes from the Lexington executed a well-planned attack that left the Shoho sinking. Fortunes reversed the next day when Japanese carrier planes from the Tsukaku and Shokaku discovered the American carriers, damaging the Yorktown. Lexington would not be so lucky. Hit by dive bombers and torpedoes, the Lex had to be abandoned and later sunk. Lieutenant Commander James Flatley led VF-42 off the Yorktown during Coral Sea and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. On the first day, he shot down a Japanese clawed fighter above the Shoho. The next day, he became one of the first Navy pilots to bag a Zero. Flatley's report of the Mitsubishi fighter was that it was superior to the F-4F in nearly every aspect. It was faster, more maneuverable, and could climb better than the Wildcat. According to Flatley, entering into a twisting, turning dogfight with a Zero was suicide. Better tactics incorporating a hit-and-run mentality would have to be implemented, and soon, a greater battle lay just ahead. Midway, a tiny island just 1,100 miles northwest of Hawaii, is long remembered as the turning point in the Pacific. Naval intelligence knew that Admiral Nagumo's carrier task force would strike the island in early June. 
Enterprise and Hornet were sent to find them. Yorktown, having undergone repairs and taken on new squadrons, soon followed. On the 4th of June, Japanese planes bombed Midway. The meager air defenses were no match for the carrier bombers and their escort of Zeros. The island was left in shambles. Once the presence of the Japanese carrier task force had been established, an all-out airstrike was launched. Torpedo and dive bombers were quickly readied for action. Aircraft launched from Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown in uncoordinated attacks proved to be the most dramatic use of carrier aircraft during the war. The torpedo squadrons and their Douglas Devastators were cut to pieces, but the dauntless dive bombers destroyed three of Nagumo's carriers. Only the Hiryu remained, and she was able to launch a counter-strike that fatally wounded the Yorktown. Later, SBD dive bombers returned to the Hiryu and sent her to rest with her sister carriers. Throughout the Battle of Midway, Wildcat pilots carried out escort duties and caps. Six Wildcats from Jimmy Thatch's VF-3 escorted torpedo bombers from the Yorktown. Thatch employed his beam defense tactics and claimed three zeros shot down. Later, in defense of the Yorktown, Thatch shot down the Kate torpedo bomber flown by Joichi Tomonanga, the leader of the attack on Midway. This was Thatch's fourth kill of the day and his sixth overall. John Smith Thatch graduated from the Naval Academy in 1927. He served on the battleships Mississippi and California before starting flight training. He received his wings in 1930. He served with VF-1 and later became a test pilot for the Navy. Thatch was assigned to VF-3 in 1939 as gunnery officer. It is here that Thatch first developed his beam defense that later evolved into the Thatch Weave. He commanded VF-3 on board the Lexington during the February battles. However, once back at Kaneohe Naval Air Station, Thatch had to reform the squadron, grabbing pilots wherever he could find them. Following the Battle of Midway, Jimmy Thatch reported to Jacksonville Naval Air Station, where carrier pilots were being trained. Later, Thatch returned to the war in the Pacific as Staff Operations Officer for Admiral Mitcher and then Admiral McCain, and was present at the official Japanese surrender on the deck of the battleship Missouri. Following the war, he returned to Jacksonville. Later, he was skipper of the aircraft carrier Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was promoted to Rear Admiral in 1955 and Admiral in 1965. He retired from the Navy in 1967. Admiral Thatch died in 1981. Other VF-3 pilots became aces at Midway. Walter Haas added a torpedo bomber to his score. Haas was the first Navy pilot to shoot down a zero back at Coral Sea. Art Brassfield raised his score to six and a third when he shot down four dive bombers. And Lieutenant J.G. Albert Scott McCuskey downed three Val dive bombers and two zeros to bring his total to six and a half kills. Tom Cheek claimed two more zeros and experienced some tense moments as he flew back to the Yorktown. When I hit, I knew something was wrong because I didn't feel the hook pick up an arresting wire. I shoved my control stick all the way forward and bent over as far as I could to get my head down and my body down into the cockpit. And I wound up with a terrific crash and thump and I realized I was upside down and I yelled, get this SOB off of me. Following the spectacular victory at Midway, the Americans went on the offensive. The first objective would be Guadalcanal, an island in the Solomon's chain. The Saratoga, Enterprise, and Wasp would support the amphibious landings. The Wasp had returned to the Pacific after delivering Royal Air Force Spitfires to the beleaguered island of Malta in the Mediterranean. The invasion began on August 7th and was challenged by land-based Japanese planes from her bow. 
A bloody air battle ensued. Five Betty bombers, nine Val dive bombers, and two Zeros were shot down for the loss of nine Wildcats. The carriers retreated from Guadalcanal once the Marines were ashore. The Japanese sent the carriers Zuikaku and Shokaku, as well as the light carrier Ryujo, to destroy the American fleet near Guadalcanal. American planes found the Ryujo and sank her. Japanese planes from the Zuikaku and Shokaku located the Enterprise and pounded her. The Big E was hit three times and suffered heavy damage. Many of her planes were forced to land on the Saratoga or at Henderson Field on Guadalcanal. The Japanese carrier planes had dealt a serious blow to the Americans, but their air crews had suffered the hand of the Wildcats, who claimed 45 attackers shot down. Failing to realize that victory was at hand, Nagumo's task force retreated. Enterprise would live to fight another day. One F-4F pilot made multiple claims during both actions. Machinist Donald Eugene Runyon shot down eight Japanese planes between August 7th and August 24th. During the attack on the Enterprise, he shot down three VAL dive bombers and added a zero for which he received the Navy Cross. Runyon was a member of VF-6 aboard Enterprise. After the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, VF-6 adopted a tombstone squadron marking on the tails of their Wildcats. Each one displayed the 41 kills claimed by the squadron. Runyon ended the war with 11 kills. Meanwhile, Marine Corps Wildcats were headed to Guadalcanal aboard the USS Long Island. Marine Corps pilots, plus some Navy and Army Air Corps, formed the Cactus Air Force that operated from Henderson Field. A nearby small strip was designated Fighter One, but its new inhabitants referred to it as the Cow Pasture. Conditions on Guadalcanal were primitive at best. Any maintenance had to be done out in the open. Refueling took place between aerial attacks. All personnel slept in tents in the jungle close to the airstrip, which was repeatedly attacked by Japanese land and carrier-based aircraft. Wildcats from VMF-223 and 224 were usually outnumbered during the inbound raids. This provided the Marine pilots plenty of targets. Heroes emerged as scores rose quickly. Major Robert Gaylor was in command of VMF-224 at Guadalcanal. He shot down 13 Japanese planes in a single month and survived being shot down twice. His gallantry and leadership earned him his nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor. Captain Marion Carl gained his first two kills flying a Wildcat during the Japanese attack on Midway. Now he was flying with VMF-223 on Guadalcanal and wasted little time adding to that score. On August 24th, Carl shot down three Japanese bombers and a Zero to become the Marine Corps' first ace. Carl finished the campaign with 16 and a half kills. Mary and Carl added two more kills when he returned to combat leading VMF-223 in Corsairs. After the war, he became the Navy's chief test pilot, setting a new world speed record in August 1947, flying the Douglas Sky Streak. In 1953, Carl set the world altitude record of 83,235 feet and a new world speed record of 1,143 miles per hour in the sky rocket. He later flew secret missions over communist China and also served in Vietnam. He eventually rose to the rank of Inspector General of the Marine Corps before retiring from service in 1973. One of the finest aviators of all time, Carl is considered by some to be the Chuck Yeager of the Marine Corps. In 1998, Marion Carl was shot to death during a robbery at his Oregon home. Wildcats on Guadalcanal were not usually adorned with kill markings, 
However, this wildcat from VMF 223 has quite a few of them added for a photo opportunity. Each rising sun indicates a Japanese plane shot down. The odd arrangement of 15 kills plus four more likely represents the scores of Marion Carl and his commanding officer, Major John L. Smith. John Lucian Smith turned down a commission in the Army to join the Marines in 1936. In 1939, he earned his Navy wings. Smith took over VMF 223 in May 1942 and led the squadron off the Long Island to Henderson Field on August 20th. In the following eight weeks, he destroyed 19 Japanese aircraft. When he returned to the States in November 1942, he was the top-scoring American ace of World War II. For his bravery and leadership on Guadalcanal, Smith was awarded the Medal of Honor. Smith commanded Marine Air Group 33 during the Korean War. He retired from the United States Marine Corps in 1960 to work for Grumman Aerospace. He then spent 10 years with Rocketdyne. At age 57, the war hero was let go amidst Rocketdyne's economic troubles. Overcome by depression, Smith took his own life in 1972. Admiral Nagumo tried again to reinforce Guadalcanal in late October, and again the American task force intercepted them, this time near the Santa Cruz Islands. The odds were in favor of the Japanese. The Wasp had been torpedoed and sunk by a Japanese submarine in September, leaving Enterprise and Hornet to stand in the way of four Japanese carriers. The two opposing forces met on October 26th. During the first strikes, American planes suffered heavy losses, but managed to damage the Zuihu and the Shokaku. However, Japanese planes bombarded the two American carriers for three hours. Enterprise somehow escaped serious damage, but the Hornet did not. Hornet desperately tried to evade her attackers, but sustained three bomb hits and as many torpedoes. Listing badly, she was abandoned. Japanese destroyers sank her later that night. During the defense of the carriers, two Wildcat pilots became aces in a day. George Leroy Wren of VF-72 shot down four torpedo planes and a dive bomber becoming the Hornet's only ace. Lieutenant Stanley Swede Vaitaza scored his first three kills flying an SBD at Coral Sea. During the Santa Cruz battle, Vaitaza shot down seven Japanese carrier bombers while defending Enterprise. Vaitaza is seen here with Lieutenant Commander Jim Flatley and Lieutenant John Lepla. Lepla had almost made ace flying a Dauntless during the Coral Sea battle. At Santa Cruz, he scored a kill in a Wildcat as a member of Flatley's VF-10, but was shot down and killed in combat with Zeros. New squadrons took over at Henderson Field. VMF-121 and 112 arrived in October. VMF-212 arrived soon after. In November, the Japanese made another ill-fated attempt to wrestle the island from the Americans. The Wildcats never had a problem finding targets, and scores continued to rise. Lieutenant Colonel Harold Joe Bauer, known as coach to the pilots on Guadalcanal, arrived in late September and took over at Fighter Command Headquarters. He flew combat missions and racked up 10 kills in a little over a month. On November 14th, he went down into the sea during a strafing mission and was never found. He was awarded a posthumous Medal of Honor. Captain Joe Foss of VMF-121 scored his first kill on October 13th, a zero. Within a month, he became the first American ace in World War II to reach 20. Early in 1943, he shot down three zeros, which made him the first to reach Eddie Rickenbacker's World War I score of 26 and the highest scoring Wildcat ace. He was the sixth Wildcat pilot to be awarded the Medal of Honor. Eight Wildcat pilots received the Medal of Honor, half of the total awarded to fighter pilots in the Pacific. 
In early 1943, Captain Jefferson de Blanc destroyed five Japanese aircraft in a single day, but was forced to bail out of his badly damaged Wildcat. For that action, he received the Medal of Honor. The final Wildcat pilot to be awarded the Medal of Honor was James Sweat of VMF-221. On April 7th, Sweat shot down eight Japanese dive bombers before exiting his mortally wounded F-4F. At Henderson Field, the Navy endured the same hardships as the Marines and shared in the successes as well. VF-11 was the highest scoring Wildcat squadron, including the Marines, from January to August 1943. Vernon Graham of VF-11 became an ace in a day on 12 June when he shot down five zeros. The first year and a half of the war in the Pacific had been costly. The United States Navy had lost four of her carriers in as many engagements. Wildcats had fought in every air battle. It is estimated that from Pearl Harbor through the Guadalcanal campaign, one out of every five F-4F pilots became a fatality. The other side of the ledger showed that over 50 Wildcat drivers had achieved A status by shooting down five or more enemy planes. Designers at Grumman considered more uses for the Wildcat. One design was a Wildcat float plane designated as the F4F-3S. Known as the Wildcatfish, the Dash 3S never went into production. However, the F4F-7, a dedicated reconnaissance version of the Wildcat, did see production. The Dash 7 had non-folding wings and the machine guns were removed to make room for extra fuel. The two pipes protruding from the tail were for dumping fuel in case of emergency. The Dash 7's combat debut was at Guadalcanal, flying long-range reconnaissance missions up the slot. By late 1943, the F-4F had been relegated to a training role and could be found at naval air stations throughout the United States, such as Norfolk, Jacksonville, and San Diego. This Wildcat was photographed at the Navy Pre-Flight School in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Even training could be hazardous. I had to bail out once of a Wildcat, and that was in my training at Jacksonville, and this was, we were on a gunnery flight, and there was seven of us in the flight, and the instructor was towed, I had to tow, and he got the tow foul, and he couldn't, he ordered by radio for the next senior man to leave, which was not me, but we wanted to take the flight and practice formation. And we went out, and he put us, he went for a right echelon, which would put us all in the right. And the man was flying on my left. He was to come under me, and he came under and hit me. And my propeller and just about wiped out him. And uh, we both went down. I got out of there in a hurry, and, and sorry to say, but the other man didn't fare so well. He, uh, he went down with his airplane. Grumman ceased production of the F-4F in 1943 in favor of the F-6F. The Hellcat, which was designed specifically to tackle the Zero, took over the decks of the carriers in the summer of 1943. Earlier in the spring, the Marine Corps had already begun replacing the Wildcat with Vought's F-4U Corsair. But the story of the Wildcat doesn't end here. In fact, the combat history of the Wildcat didn't even start in the Pacific. The Wildcat first entered combat in the Royal Navy as the Martlet. Fleet Air Arm Martlets destroyed a German Luftwaffe Ju-88 reconnaissance bomber on Christmas Day 1940, nearly a year before the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. The British used Martlets for convoy escort duty in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean as well as anti-submarine patrols. General Motors took over Wildcat production in 1943. Their FM-1 was very similar to the F-4F-4, except that the armament was returned to four machine guns. 
GM's FM2 Wildcat continued Grumman's design for a lighter Wildcat specifically for escort carrier duty. The FM2 was powered by the Pratt & Whitney R182056, which proved to be lighter yet more powerful than earlier Wildcat engines, giving the FM2 the reputation of being the hotter Wildcat. The United States Navy also used the Wildcat in the Battle of the Atlantic. Wildcats flew off the decks of the smaller escort carriers in composite squadrons alongside Grumman Avengers. These squadrons were employed specifically in the anti-submarine role to halt the U-boat menace. Seen here in the Atlantic paint scheme are F-4Fs and FM-2s on the USS Core. In command of VC-13 was Lieutenant Commander Charles W. Brewer. Brewer led two successful attacks against U-boats in 1943. The following year, he became an ace flying an F-6F Hellcat during the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, but was posted missing in action later the same day. In the Pacific, FM-2s usually flew from CVEs or CVLs, performing carrier air patrols while the Hellcats, and later Corsairs, flew on strike missions. Commander Snyder flew FM-2s aboard the Kitkin Bay. The Jeep carrier came in as a floating pilot spool, and we followed the fleet. As they lost a plane or a pilot, they would send us over and take that place. On the day of my birthday, the operations officer there had a coin in his hand, and he says, all right, you guys, I've got two slots. Who wants what? And we didn't know A from B, and so he we said, well, heads, Kitkin Bay, B, Gambier Bay. So I get reached. I got the privilege of going aboard VC-5 on the Kitkin Bay, which was flying Wildcats. During the two-day Battle of Leyte Gulf, FM-2 pilots claimed a third of all Japanese aircraft shot down. During the final phase of the war, FM-2s were still a critical part of the task force, providing cover against kamikaze suicide attacks. Flying over the beachheads of Guam, Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa, FM-2s provided close air support for landing Marines or Army troops. FM-2s were also used as spotters for naval gunfire from battleships and cruisers against shore installations. Production of FM-2s ended in May 1945. A total of 7,900 Wildcats had been built more than half of them as FM-2s. Thus ended the combat career of the only Navy fighter to be in frontline service from the beginning of the war to the end. In retrospect, the stubby Grumman fighter had done its job well. Maybe the Wildcat's victory to loss ratio of seven to one does not compare with that of the Hellcat or Corsair, but perhaps we owe a little more to the Wildcat and her pilots. Wildcats had held the line at a time when the outcome of the war in the Pacific was very much in doubt. Securing the F-4F spot in naval aviation history as a proven fighter aircraft and a valiant defender.